You're listening to the Elephant in the Room Property Podcast, where the big things that never get talked about actually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia. And I'm Chris Bates, financial planner, mortgage broker and wealth coach. And together, we're going to uncover who's really making the decisions when you buy a property. In this episode, we're going to talk about something a little bit different, and this is sustainability and property. Our guest is a professor in property, and what we really talked about is the future of housing and some amazing technologies that will come out in the future that will change the way that we build buildings. Really, when you think about it, we've got potentially 10 million residential properties in Australia, and while we can start thinking about what's the future technologies for future buildings, the real opportunity is retrofitting and changing what our current buildings are doing. So this is a conversation where we actually start talking about some groundbreaking technologies that you know we didn't even know about that are going to come out, but also just some simple things that we can do right now to make your homes not only more comfortable, but more environmentally sustainable. It is interesting. I mean, when, again, looking at this algae building uh, technology and... Uh, when I was looking at it, I also found that you can use algae to bioremediate grey water. So potentially you can have the panels on the outside of the building, you've got a great big tank underneath the building. So in terms of energy and water, you might not be totally off-grid, but you're less reliant on the grid. Please stick around for this week's Elephant Rider Boot Camp, and we have a cracking Dumbo of the Week coming up. Before we get started, everything we talk about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent. They will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances. Now let's get cracking. As our population grows, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, and as our governments, both state and federal, seek to encourage large-scale residential construction in order to house us all, Our built environment is going to change, whether we like it or not. Now, the challenge for some individuals will be overcoming the idea that we need a backyard in order to raise a family. And for established communities, it will be how to accommodate more people without feeling overcrowded and losing the essence of their locale. Now, urban planners are working on new precincts and they'll be hopefully considering how exactly we'll be living in the future as well as how to integrate these new suburbs into the rest of the city. But all of us need to be concerned about the environmental impact of these developments, not just in the construction phase, but throughout the life of each building, which leads to another issue. Are these buildings ultimately disposable? Is there any thought given to whether these buildings will be surviving for the next 100, 200 or even 300 years? And these are big issues indeed. And who better to discuss them with us than Australia's first female professor of property, Sarah Wilkinson, from the University of Technology, Sydney. Sarah has over 34 years of professional experience in both the UK and Australia, having originally started her career as a chartered building surveyor, and she's worked on public and private sector projects across various scales, including commercial, residential and adaptive reuse projects, you know, converted warehouses, for example. Now, Sarah's academic career started in 1991, and she has developed courses and led subject groups in building surveying and building technology, property and real estate and property development Her own research has her working at the intersections of sustainability, urban development and transformation. And her three main areas of focus are building adaptation, sustainability and resilience and green roofs. So this is going to be a very interesting chat. We're very excited about where it may lead. Thank you for joining us, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I mean, I, I think Veronica and I have spoken about lots of time about the building quality that's been built and whether it is actually sustainable, then what are we actually going to do with all these poorly built buildings? So we haven't actually done an episode on sustainability and the future of kind of housing. How did you kind of get into sustainability in the first place? Was it kind of, you know, you're always moving in that path or was it a big big moment and you thought, I really care about this? Well, I know exactly when it was. It was uh, 30, nearly 31 years ago Mm -hmm. now. I was... uh, Pregnant with my first son, mm-hmm. I got stuck in a roof space uh, in North, North Wales and uh, come back to work the next day and told them that I couldn't get down through the access hatch. <laughs> and <I went> <laughs> How exit. did you get stuck in a roof? Oh, sorry, oh, well, it was, a hot, it was a hot July day. Uh, I'd done everything I needed to do in the property and the only thing I needed to check was whether they'd sorted out the dry rot in the roof space and went up into the roof space and 
the heat up there. I expanded when I went to get down. Um, I didn't fit through the access. Oh wow! Patch. Yeah, it was a yeah, it was a bit a of a physical <laughs> realization. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Must have been one of those one sunny days in North of Wales. Yeah, was it? very unusual. You just but had to wait till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but the, yeah, so the but, funniest <laughs> thing was I I went back to the office in London and uh, no one none of the surveyors would go out on site with me at that stage because they thought I would go into labour and you know I'd give birth sort of ten minutes later and I kept saying I think it takes a bit longer but you know. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, so they said to me, okay, well, we think you shouldn't go out on site anymore. One of our clients at the time was British Petroleum, who just uh, spilled millions of gallons of oil into Prince William Sound mm-hmm. in Canada. It was an absolute environmental disaster. Yep. And so they said to us, they said, look, um, you know, can you sort of uh, give us some information and advice about environmental things we can implement in our buildings? And so... Trevor sort of explained it to me and I said, uh, what do you mean? He said, you know, environmental services. I said, environmental services? He said, yeah, you know, green buildings. I said, green buildings? <laughs> he said, yeah, green building. Go, go, go. And so I went and read about it. Ah, oh, right, okay. And I read these books that were published whilst I was at uni and I never heard of it at uni and I thought, this is just sensible building. Mm. This is using resources that are local, that are renewable, that, you know, don't cost a lot of energy to to manufacture and to transport. Why aren't we doing this? And, you know, if you look back at um, the buildings that have stood the test of time over centuries, you know, they were built using local materials Mm. and, you know. So where in the world, back to say, what was this like? Like late eighties, let's this say. Is late eighties. So yeah. when, where in the world? Because there's always leaders in. Where were these books kind of say? Was it Denmark? Was it like? Because uh, I mean, these are the type of places that have seemed at the forefront. Were they at the forefront of buildings back then? Yeah, well, or? funnily enough, the the there's the Centre for Alternative Technology, which is actually in North Wales. Yeah. Um, that uh, specialises in, in environmental building, but very much then it was at a smaller scale it wasn't at these sort of high density right you know high rise sort of stuff um bre in watford which is the building research establishment they also got onto it quite early yeah and launched their environmental assessment model in the early 90s and that was one of the first ones that came out so i then moved into teaching in 1991 and we started an environmental building practice subject and I said to the students at the time, I said, if you graduate and go out into the workplace and start talking about green buildings, no one will know what you're talking about. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but I do think it will catch on because, yep. you know, it, it just makes sense really. And obviously we know more and more about climate change and the impacts that are happening. We have to take take action. When did you think it actually caught on? I think in the mid nineties, it you know it started, you know more courses started to be offered. It became uh, part of assessment for professional um, accreditation. Um, so it sort of started to kind of gather momentum there, and as more people sort of came into it and started talking about it, more rating tools were established. Um, they increased standards in building regulations for energy efficiency. I mean, originally, the building regulations in the UK, um, energy efficiency was mandated in the 80s, but that was because of an energy crisis. That was because the price of oil went up and we didn't have a good mm. supply. Mm. So it was purely, purely economic <coughs> driver to try and keep the, the prices down. Mm. Well, it's a little bit like the issue we've got with solar Solar heat is solar power now, isn't it? The energy prices are going up, so we're looking at uh, at other sources yeah, of energy. Yeah, yeah. Mm. No, yeah. it's interesting, actually. I'm doing a project at the moment on algae building, which is a, a, a renewable, and, you know, people are saying that coal, oil and gas were the fossil fuels. They sort of were the industrial revolution power source. Mm. And the 21st century is going to be the renewables. Yep which is your solar and your biofuels. Uh, Alberta in Canada, 
their whole economy has been predicated on oil and gas. Yeah. They're investing millions of Canadian dollars into biofuels as they sort of reposition their economy for the 21st century. But the algae building is interesting yeah, because it's there's only one building in the world at the moment that uses this technology and they have facade panels and the sun hits the facade panels and you've got algae growing in sort of right. water solution. Like yeah, ponds on the all roof these or something. bubbles coming out. This <laughs> <laughs> and that calls the the well, you, exterior out. Yeah. Well, what you've basically got is you've got solar thermal thermal energy in the panels that goes through a heat exchanger in the plant room, and yep. you can use that heat to heat up hot water for showering and hydronic heating. Mm. It's in Germany, and then and that's that's. Um... Like water in your pipes under your floors, warming. Yeah, your house. Or radiators. Just, just, yeah, they call them radiators, but they're not actually radiators. Mm. They sort of they got hot water running yeah. through them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just but a lot of Australians, and particularly those in north of Sydney and North, wouldn't have a clue <laughs> no, what that is. Yeah. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but very common in Europe. Yes, mm. and uh, then they harvest the biomass, and the biomass gets converted into biofuel. And when you have got a biofuel, oh, okay. you've got an energy source. So that's that's the way that goes. So, so it's using this, the power of the sun, not just for solar energy to actually heat, you know, at multiple levels now where, yeah, yeah. it's, it's kind of who knows what, what's going to come out in the future, I guess, if, if this exactly. is the first one that we, wouldn't have been possible a couple of years ago. No, well, yeah. that's right. I mean, we've, we've um, designed a couple of panels which arrived a couple of weeks ago at UTS. I'm just waiting for the support frames to arrive and then we're, going to set them up on the roof of the science building because we work with the Deep Green Biotech Hub and um, we're going to start monitoring sort of the production levels here because we did think that, you know, here we have a lot more sun over a lot longer period Mm. of the year. Potentially we could generate more energy. So these sort of pilot panels are going to sort of test that. Mm -hmm. But so that's a, that's very different, but... And at the moment, economically, it doesn't stack up. It's too expensive. Mm. But yeah. when I did the feasibility study a couple of years ago, I looked at solar, and in the 1950s, solar energy cost over $2,700 a watt. Mm. So when I wrote the, the report in 2016, it was costing $1.14 a watt, and it's probably come down since then. And that was indexed? As in? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So... It's sort of... Um, and then how does that really work? How does the, the cost of that go down? Does it, it's when basically mass production yeah, is possible? Yeah, economies of scale mm. yeah. and also innovation. So basically, I know I'm... Well, I hope I'm building a dinosaur and I'll put it out there and somebody else will go along and say, Sarah, you idiot, you should have done this. Yeah. You, you know, you'll get innovations in pumping technology, innovations in glazing technology, the seals... Some people will say, well, you've got a cavity in there of 65 mil, you should do 90 mil, yep. et cetera, et cetera. And also, I think there are over half a million algae species. Mm. So, And I will be testing one. Which, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So but, is, there, is there a use to all the uh, the green algae, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> congregating well, in our river uh, systems? Yeah. I mean, this was the thing because previously as a building surveyor, if somebody called me up and said, oh, we've got algae in our building, it was a real problem. Mm. It was the services had leaked. It was probably smelt. It was a slip hazard. And, you know, some algae can also be deleterious to human health. Mm-hmm. So it completely reversed my... Previous view of algae. <laughs> yeah. And that's, it's a that's, bit like mould on cheese, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Which is quite tasty. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to get the wrong mould, though. <laughs> but that was the other thing is I was just amazed doing the research what a, um, an amazing organism algae is because you can use it for fibre, you can use it for fertiliser, you can use it for feedstock, mm. and also it is a great source of protein and mm. You know, historically, we have got our proteins from uh, meat products mm. and cattle, you know, farting methane is a very, very dangerous greenhouse gas that takes hundreds of years longer mm. than carbon dioxide 
to dissipate in the atmosphere. So we really need to get over our hamburgers and get to yep. our algae burgers. Yeah. But <laughs> you can also put it in beer. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, in Melbourne you can get a blue latte, which uh, is uh, a latte with algae in because of the protein. Can yeah, you? there you go. I mean, all these new technologies <laughs> haven't really existed. I mean, what's your thoughts on kind of like the, what's the other technologies? Like you know, there's, there's some wood buildings kind of going up in Sydney now, which yeah. I think people were thinking, well, why would you build a building out of wood? Won't it burn down? Okay. But So uh, the village I come from in Essex, Rochford, um, one of one of the buildings there dates from the 1400s. It's a timber frame building. It's been a house. It's been the council offices. It's been a house. It's been the council offices. So over the years, the uses have changed, and that building is still there. Mm. You know. So um, how high is it? It's only a two story timber frame house, but yep. <laughs> I'm thinking about <laughs> yeah. the height of the people inside yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you had to stoop, <laughs> little people. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, yeah, the CLT or the mm. cross-laminated timber is great and mm. uh, that's very strong. I mean, I think in Hackney in London now they've got a 15-storey uh, timber frame building. Yep. Wow. And we've got the one down at Brangaroo and I think there's another one just gone up in Brisbane that is yep. about 14 storeys, something like that. So it's obviously not just knocking down our old-growth forests to, to build these things. This is interesting because mm. I was going to ask a question you were talking about um, – you know, the first books that were written about environmental design, uh, building construction yeah. and the, the fundamental press, uh, premise is really using local materials. And so if you think about, you know, in Italy or France, for instance, or even England, some of those yeah. older buildings, they're all built out of local stone. Well, that's yeah. a finite resource and obviously yeah. a resource that takes millions of years to create, probably billions maybe. Um, <laughs> all the yeah. geologists yeah. will yeah. just yeah. quiver. <laughs> go, millions, you're kidding me. So, but the point being that, that you're going to run out, you can't, and we've got population growth and so yes. we can't sustainably build enough out of local materials. Yeah. But this is sort of like a re-imagination, I guess, of timber, which is a local material or can be a local material yeah. depending on where you are. So, yeah, so so tell us more about how this has come about. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, the, timber is great because it has a lovely warm look about it as well. And You don't uh, have to hide these kind of big, you know, Concrete walls and steel. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I do love it, a bit of concrete wall and steel. Yeah. <laughs> <I just quite. laughs> yeah. So, uh, and um, obviously, what what you have is you've got the the logging of the timber and the transportation, and then the milling and manufacturing into the cross laminated uh, columns and beams. But it, if you're replanting your forests, then obviously mm. you're growing the stock for the the next generation of buildings or whatever. And in the meantime, of course, you've got habitat for biodiversity. You've got material that is sequestering carbon and giving off oxygen. Mm. That sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm on board with that. That yeah. sounds bloody good. Yeah. So how many buildings would you estimate are built currently using any of this technology? Very, very few. Mm. Very, very few. And... It's it is interesting. I mean, I think I think it, we've got eleven years in which to take it sufficient action to stop mm -hmm. irreversible climate change. So we really need to pull our fingers out big time. Uh, we've not got time to mess around again. And you know, even even in a flat out boom with construction. Um, you only add about two to three percent to the total stock of buildings. So even over the last few years, where we've yeah. had all these cranes everywhere, the bulk of our stock is already here. Mm. So that's why I've always focused on retrofitting and adaptation, yep. because uh, the bulk of what we've got is here. And if you look at the chance for temperature increase, increasingly mm. what we've got is no longer going to be comfortable. We're going to have to use more energy yep. to be comfortable in our homes. And so that's going to accelerate <laughs> carbon emissions. So, you know, we've got this sort of uh, nasty, I suppose, I don't know, conundrum to, <clears throat> to try and sort out. So we need to retrofit our existing buildings yep. so that they don't use so much energy mm. to be comfortable and, 
when you look at retrofit, you've got sort of low hanging fruit, so things you can do quite easily. So yep. painting buildings light colours to reflect heat rather than absorb heat. Mm. Putting shadings over window openings so that you don't get that heat penetration mm. through the glazing, which is a weak spot. Uh, they're fairly simple things. Yep. Then doing things like upgrading the 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 envelope so it's thermally more efficient. Mm. That's obviously more tricky because if you do it internally, then you're losing some of your floor space, space. which yeah. people don't like to do. Mm. Uh, if you do it externally, then it involves planning, permission, and all those sorts of things. So you know it does. So possibly we're going to have to look at maybe combination of measures, perhaps some incentive programs, perhaps some relaxation of planning uh, yep. to encourage people to do these things. You made a really good point there about, uh, you know, everyone's thinking, oh, well, let's just build all this new property, right? Let's kind of build, you know, let's all the future properties will build out this great technology, mm. et cetera. But, you know, we're not going to forget about the existing stock. And you said about roughly 3% of the, you know, property that gets added on the market is new. Yeah. And I think for our listeners, it's something for – us to think about. And that's one of the reasons why when we're talking about, you know, property investment, a lot of people think, oh, buy new. But really you're thinking about such a small part of the market, you're forgetting about the rest of the market, which is the established market. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think people don't even realise that that's how few, you know, new apartments and buildings we create every year is actually very, very small. And I guess around sustainable design, exactly, you shouldn't really be thinking about the 3%, you should be thinking about the 100% yeah. and what you can do it. Do you think it's a bit of a, a chicken and egg though? Because why would you, if you own a commercial building, unless you look at it as an as an investment for most people, yeah. um, why would you go down a retrofitting way if it's going to cost you a lot more money, but you're not going to get a lot more rent? And I guess that's probably you know who's yeah. who's at fault yeah. here. Is it, is it mean, the... Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I guess depending on how you approach it, and um, you know, as I say, there's various levels of retrofit from a light retrofit mm. to a deep retrofit. And with commercial buildings, if you're talking about sort of large office buildings, then what you can sometimes do is um, retrofit with the tenants in situ. So you maybe have a couple of floors that are vacant, you do all your retrofitting to those floors, then you move tenants up and then you mm. do the floors they've vacated. So that enables you to maintain an income whilst you're mm. doing your your retrofit. And I think most tenants, and I think this will increase as times go by, will be very keen to be associated with, uh, you know, an environmentally good performing building rather than uh, something that's, uh, you know, doing damage to the environment. So you may find that your retention is better yep. and you may find that um, you get less vacant periods because tenants will want to come and rent in your building. Yeah, so, I mean, Atlassian is probably the biggest one in Australia. They come out recently and they said, look, we want to be 100% renewables across our whole organisation and, you know, and yeah. so that comes from the building, everything mm. you could possibly imagine, the way that they power their computers, you know, everything. Yeah. And so... I don't know, I kind of feel like it's the corporations that say we want green buildings, we want only retrofitted, et cetera. Yeah. And if when that gets the demands there, then the investors will say, hang on a sec, yeah. we could actually get more rent. We can yeah. actually create, you know, actually a higher yield and that will increase our asset value. So Yeah. It is interesting. I mean, when, again, looking at this algae building uh, technology and uh, when I was looking at it, I also found that you can use algae to bioremediate grey water. So potentially you can have the panels on the outside of the building, you've got a great big tank underneath the building. So in terms of energy and water, you might not be totally off-grid, but you're less reliant on the grid. Mm, and if wow. you think of our infrastructure for water and power, mm. it's pretty much at capacity. It tends to be laid in big pipes under our roads. So if we want to increase capacity, we've got to block the road off dig up the pipes to put a bigger pipe down. So yeah. having buildings that are partially off-grid is going to extend the life of our infrastructure, which, uh, mm. you know, is going to be less disruptive to people. Now, there's a big development across the road from uh, UTS. 
Central Park. Now, yes, yeah, how, which is fantastic. Yeah, it's interesting because I know that there's a big cogen plant in there. Yes. And that was a requirement of council, yeah. I believe. Um, and the building itself has got the, well, it boasts the a tallest vertical green wall in the world, I yeah, think. Yeah, um, certainly. I think, yeah, it's certainly in Australia. Yeah, well, somewhere. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. the tall, a very bloody tall mm. yeah. green wall. I mean, do you look at that and, and you said that's great. So tell me, what is great about that complex? Yeah. Well, again, uh, sort of green roofs was something I came across um, and sort of when I sort of sat down and read about it, I just thought, what a great roofing yeah. system, you know, because um, you've got thermal, another thermal layer, so it makes your building more energy efficient. You don't get heat loss. Um, is that because of the soil? Yeah, because yeah. of the soil. So um got to make sure you get really good waterproofing up there. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is the other thing. I mean, because once you've got your green roof system on, you've actually protected your waterproof layer from solar degradation. Ah. What tends to make our roofing systems fail is exposure to the sun. Ah. So because they're no longer exposed to the sun, they will last, you it's know. like a super thick tile. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, again, you've got... Uh, the you know, the plants will give off oxygen, so it improves your uh, air quality. You've got biodiversity habitat for you know the bugs and the birds and other things. Um, the urban heat island uh, city centres can be up to five degrees hotter yep. than the peri-urban areas. Mm. Just and, not in Sydney though. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So was that because of a harbour? Well, I think the there was a harbour and we've got the parks, but out west, I think it's it's, it's kind just of does, dry gets ass, hotter and it? dry, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Putting so, my weather hat on. Yes, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I remember once driving out west and get, opening the car door and nearly melting, and then looked yeah. at the at the temperature gauge on the car and it's ten degrees hotter than it was yeah. in Balmain in, where I'd left yeah. from, and yeah. you know it was yeah. only a forty five minute drive. drive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is, but it, 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 as I say. A lot of studies are showing that if we put green infrastructure, green walls, green roofs, we can, uh, um, you know, dampen that urban heat island effect. Yep. And the other, another project I worked on about three years ago was called the Urban Ecology Renewal Investigation Project, and that looked at um, species and species extinction. And I think we've had something like sixty percent of species yep. have gone extinct in the last short period. Yeah. Oh, which is horrific. Phenomenal, mm. yeah. yeah. And basically, you know, if we've just got vast areas of concrete and tarmac, then there's no way for these animals to have a pathway to somewhere else that might be more amenable to their continued yeah. existence. So we're accelerating extinction by not providing habitat for these species. And... Uh, that was the other thing that when I moved up to Sydney from Melbourne and uh, the city of Sydney LGA, it covers about 25 square kilometres. And I read that there's only, um, and I have to get this right, 4% left of uh, indigenous flora and fauna that existed when the Europeans arrived, mm. which is uh, another dam damning indictment on uh, what we've done here, which is one square kilometre. And so potentially with green walls and green roofs, we can reintroduce indigenous species and there's no reason why we couldn't actually be 25 square kilometres plus. If you look at Singapore. I was just about to mention <laughs> Singapore because I was only there very recently oh, yeah. and I was, I was looking and, uh, and reading up on it and apparently there's 47% green space yeah. there. Yeah. And and I have to say, I don't love Hong Kong, but the air in Singapore is so much, much cleaner, cleaner. Yeah. so much cleaner, noticeably yeah. cleaner. But also they utilise their roof tops yes. a lot in order to achieve that. I was and, yeah. and But the vision of um, the benevolent dictator um, <laughs> is that, you know, that he wants the city to be in a garden. Yeah. And I thought, what an amazing yeah. vision. Yeah. Well, that was. I'd, an, another project I did a couple of years ago was looking at whether a mandatory or a voluntary approach to green roofs and green walls would work best. And we did case studies of uh, Toronto, Singapore, London, Rotterdam, Stockholm, and had a look at what they'd done. Yep. And Singapore, 
by far had had the best uptake in green roofs and green walls. And we came across this garden city concept. And basically, a very wise person realised that nobody would come and live and do business in Singapore if it was a concrete jungle mm. with air quality problems. Mm. Yeah. And so... Good for see it. Yeah. So theirs is a voluntary uh, system, but voluntary in Singapore is... De facto mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> See, I love an autocracy. I, yeah. I really do. I, when you've got a good autocrat yeah. in place who right. has actually got vision and, and um, well, that's right. Does Think care. Stuff gets done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, humans are naturally quite lazy, quite greedy, unfortunately. And unless we're forced to do things, yeah. um, you know, and unfortunately with the environment, and you know, we're quite disposable world yeah. that we live in, and. You know, unless we force people to stop using plastic bags, unless we force people to yes. stop buying gas guzzling cars yeah. or, you know, there's certain things. I, I think you yeah. need to force yeah. people to to actually make good behavioural change mm. and, you know, and to they don't know what's good for them at first and then after they start changing habits then they start understanding and educating themselves, then yeah. you start to create change. And I think that at first, though, people are like, oh, I've got so many other priorities going on and yeah. it just pushes down the list. So, yeah, yeah I mean. There's a, there's a, I'm doing a project at the moment with KTH in Stockholm and we're looking at the human behaviour stuff. And uh, we uh, came across a paper that has classified seven drag dragons behaviour and basically they've classified into different sort of groups how we justify to ourselves mm. not to act basically. Yeah. And sometimes it's genuine ignorance. Sometimes it's um, sort of a <laughs> <laughs> fear of being different. So, you yeah. know, if you're the first person in your street to have the algae building panels, you know, and people laughing at you and saying, look, yeah. you've got slime all over your house. Are you mm. kidding? Um, you know, but gradually things do change. And the the plastic bags is a, is a good one, I think. He's within the last sort of 18 months, I think, We've we've actually got to the stage now where you see people carrying stuff out of the supermarkets in their hands rather yep. than purchase a bag. <laughs> yeah. And maybe it's the cost that it's you have the to 15 pay 15 cents. cents yeah. <laughs> uh, but maybe it's that kind of, oh, no. I don't, I don't need a bag. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe it's that. Yeah. You know, I often uh, mm. I carry one of those little bags, the little carry bags in yeah. every bag I've got. Um, yeah. And there's many times that like I don't actually need a bag, but before we didn't even question, we just took a bag. Well, that's right. That's right. And so I th the the big question is if we can change our behaviour in time. That's the thing. And I think it's really interesting at the moment seeing that Greta Thun Thunberg, Thunberg uh, the S Swedish girl that uh, is sort of going around talking to governments in Europe, she's sort of, encouraging the school strikes and uh, I, yep, yep. you know, I think these kids, they're absolutely right because by the time they grow to your age or my age, it's absolutely wrecked. Pretty sad though, right? The kids are the ones who are creating change in <laughs> yeah. a world where, you know, they're not really, they should be going to school and, you yeah. know, and learning and instead they're trying to force adults to take action on climate mm. change. It's, yeah, it's, but um, then you get this, like I just seriously sort of tweet today I don't spend a lot of time in Twitter, but I just happened to just open yeah. it and there was this tweet. Somebody I actually do know and he's, um, you know, he's a very successful businessman, very right wing. Yeah. Um, and he's like, oh, my God, this is ridiculous. You know, my daughter's sent me a message saying that her geography teacher told her, told the class that by 2050 a third of them would starve to death. <laughs> well. <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> yeah. it, it, I mean, it, 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 it is. It sounds shocking, but that's, that's another area we're looking at is food security mm. uh, because, you know, we're quite fortunate here in that our supply chains are maybe less vulnerable than perhaps other places, but yeah. certainly European countries. Yeah. And so these urban farms uh, are coming up and that's another kind of area that I've also been well, this, looking at. This yeah. is interesting because Australia, Sydney's been building into its food bowl now for decades. Mm. So... <laughs> Yeah, well, again, sort of looking to the future and sort of thinking, okay, uh, a lot of the big box retail and the retail, the department stores are really struggling with online buying and mm. they tend to have uh, huge sort of floor-to-ceiling heights, big spaces in shopping centres. 
you know, once they've gone, maybe the other retailers will struggle and that yeah. sort of thing. And uh, car parking as well. If we yeah. look at possibly driverless vehicles and, um, you know, car sharing models becoming more the norm, a lot of our car parking areas are below offices and below high density residential. So what are we going to do with them? I mean, if they're underground, you can't convert them for mm. habitable no. accommodation. <laughs> so I think they're potentially great spaces for high tech urban farms. Yeah. Mm, and you reduce your carbon food miles and your transportation and vitally you in, you increase your food security. Yeah. And I know EY's done one of those in Sydney, you know, it's underneath their building. They've created a green farm as a bit of a yes. kind of test case. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. exactly. Like if you don't have to ship this, you know, the tomatoes in from South Australia and that's get on a truck and then the truck has to get here and let's go to the supermarket. Um, you know, so, I think there yeah. is, you know, you so say, you got, you say on, so you got, you got solar panels on your roof, yeah. right, to to power the, what do you need, ultraviolet light? What's the sort of light that they need? The, yeah. the UV light. Yeah. UV light, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, so they're, they're, does the fact that they don't have regular sunlight, does that change anything in, in a plant? Well, it can't be any worse than oh, kind of pesticides. Oh, because they do say hydroponic then. marijuana is yeah. better. Yeah. Not that I've it's, partaken it's, in this, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> LED lighting um, kind of has the UV kind of thing. And, there are, yeah, aero farms. If you look up aero farms mm. uh, in uh, New York and you'll see stacks, you know, probably 10, 15 stacks mm. of... Uh, Plants growing probably in 500, mm. 600 mil centres. And so if you think about the floor area of that compared to an open paddock. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you're And perfect production. sunlight Cause, every day. Because all those solar yeah. panels are going to be out yeah. there taking out the paddock space. That's right. <laughs> I mean, basically, plants only grow at the speed they grow out, out in nature because the sun goes down yeah. every day. But if you've got 24 hours sunshine or whatever. With perfect mm. watering you, every day. And yeah, perfectly, optimum. There's yeah. no seasonal yeah. produce then. It's That's just, right. Or it's like Singapore all year round. Exactly. In the and basement. It, it will get very high tech. Um, you'll have sensors, you know, monitoring optimum yeah. moisture content, mm. et cetera, et cetera. And then possibly even robots picking them. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there's already that. There's already <laughs> robotic farming's pretty, robots are probably on the, one of the biggest things they're taking over is agriculture and being able to 3D map farms yeah. and see where the weeds are and yeah. automatically a drone will go over yeah. and, you know, put a bit of pesticide yeah. on it and things like that, which a human would, you know, never yeah. be able to do and mm. and then be able to do that on scale because you don't need hours and, yeah. and things like that. So I think farming's, you know, got yeah. a huge future ahead. I mean, green roofs, I haven't really seen any in Sydney. Um, oh, we've got quite a few. Is we, but residential? Um, yes, I think there's one just... Up here, actually. What'd you, so, what'd you say? Grid roof, like green, green roofs. Roof. Oh, green roofs. Yeah. Green roofs. Like, yeah. It's just not something that you. We've really taken. Oh, there's taken quite on. a few around. Yeah, if it, the city of Sydney used to have a website which would tell you where all the green roofs were mm. in this area, and uh, say at UTS, our alumni green, uh, green space behind the, the beautiful, brutal concrete tower, <laughs> the bunker. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. that's right. That is actually a green roof over a book depository. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's different types of green roof. You can have a green roof um, just for sort of thermal performance or even stormwater attenuation. Yeah. And that's another big benefit here because we're predicted to have less frequent rainfall but more intense rainfall. Mm. So that could lead to flash flooding and overwhelming of the drainage systems, mm. et cetera, whereas your green roofs and your parks and your path, you know, pathways will absorb that and slow that runoff down. And um, another type of green roof you can have is for social interaction and yep. et cetera. So yep. a number of medium-density places, and there is one just up the top here in Redfern. Yep. Um, yeah. There's one in Surrey Hills too. Yeah. That yeah, there's a where few you around. go up on the roof. Chalmers, and, Chalmers Street, I think you're thinking yes, about in Redfern. Yeah, yeah. and mm. there's the one actually, the Aboriginal Centre, I think, in Redfern has got a rooftop garden on it. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of rooftop gardens. I haven't really seen the walking through. Like I was thinking more like you know suburbs, mm. and you're coming along, and it's like a house, 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 and bang, there's a house with a green roof on it. Um, you yeah, know, I feel like the you know, the on the actual suburb level, we haven't really even yeah. thought about it. I mean, 
It was interesting. About five years ago, um, somebody who was living in Marrickville was trying to put a green roof on an extension on their house. And yeah. They were really having a struggle with the planners at that time, trying to get the things through the, the system to get all the permissions and approvals. And because it was something they hadn't really had a lot of experience mm. of. Yep. And there were some concerns. And uh, so. Well, they'd have to think. Yes. You know, and it goes yeah. outside all the checklists that they've well, already got. Well, that's right. So, you can't yeah. do that tick and flick. Yep, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Mm. But I, and I think that is the thing is you have to go outside your comfort zone and embrace something that's new to you or whatever. Well, you've got to be ready to fight for uh, it too. Yeah, I mean, in right. that situation, you've got to be so passionately. Persistent. Yeah. To, to actually to get not it through. Not cave. That's so what right. happened yeah. in that case out of curiosity? So five years ago someone was trying to get it through and then they probably just gave up in the end, did they? Yeah, I don't know actually. I, I'd have to uh, right. follow him up and find out. Yep. Um, but there, was one on, was... there was an episode on Grand Designs um, some years ago of a house in Glebe mm. and the whole part of it was, you know, very much about having this, yeah. this roof space mm. and a green space yeah. up there. And, um, yeah, I mean. It's... Well, that's, yeah, I think I looked at Melbourne about, Ten years ago, and um, something like twenty nine percent of all horizontal spaces in CBDs are roof spaces, mm. and so it's sort of looking at what you could retrofit. And I, I did a, a survey of about five hundred and fifty odd buildings, and was very, very conservative, and and said that seventeen percent of them could be done, could be retrofitted, and that was looking at plant system on the roof and all that sort of business. Mm. And Paul Osmond at UNSW, he did a very similar thing here for City of Sydney and he he came up with 20%. So we were both pretty close and we both felt that we'd been very, very conservative. Mm. Uh, So there's lots of scope out there. And Have you come across the organisation Rooftop Honey? No. Oh, yes, I think I have with it's the beehives. M- yeah, 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 it's Melbourne-based yeah. and I don't know a lot about it but and I think that they've sort of ventured into Sydney as well. Yeah. So it's a way of, yeah. once again, you know, we've got a, bit, a bee yeah. shortage or well, bees are in, yeah. un- endangered. And um... a- AECOM did a um, report two years ago on green infrastructure and they found then that um, property with good green infrastructure, residential property with green Good green infrastructure in Sydney was 17% higher values. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because I was just about to mention an episode we did, episode 62 with Cecile Weldon. She's from the Centre oh, yes, of Livability, so you know Cecile. Yeah. Cecile. And, you know, we were having this debate about, you know, it's a bit chicken and the egg too, about, well, does that create the value or does the demand for that create the value and then at which point does it take over? Because the demand's yeah. obviously got to be there, but then at, the, at some point the actual existence of these features will yeah. create the demand. I, I think as human beings um, we have this relationship with nature, biophilia effect, and um, so when we come across a space that has, is very natural. We like it. Yeah. And we don't necessarily say, I like this because of that tree yeah, or that bush. Or cellular. <laughs> we, yeah, we just mm. say, oh, this is really nice. I like this. And we, yeah. we don't deconstruct it. But if you did, you'd find out that it was actually. Yeah, it's know, the trees that make you feel happy yeah, rather than the. Yeah. The flowers, the lawns, you yeah. know, that, you know, a view, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So you said it there. Uh, the, the dictator in uh, Singapore, but you yes. said he's got a the futuristic view that he had some time ago that he wanted to create a garden. What's your yeah. kind of utopia view if you were going to design Sydney for the future? What would be some of the key elements that you would bring into the Sydney kind of housing market, I guess, and commercial market? Yeah, I, I mean, that, again, is very interesting uh, because there is a competition open at the moment in the city of Sydney for alternate housing and it's looking at um, ideas generation on alternative housing. And, uh, we're I'm sure actually... a kid will probably win that, will they? <laughs> <laughs> and if it's a good idea, that's great. It doesn't matter how old they are. Um, Seven-year-old. <laughs> yeah. But what, what we've, actually, we've actually put in a pitch 
uh, a colleague of mine at UTS, Alan Morris, he's in the Institute of Public Policy Guidance. So he comes from policy and social um, sciences. And what what you have is you ha if you count up all of the bedrooms in the city of Sydney or mm. in Sydney, yeah. there's so many empty bedrooms in properties. There should be no homeless people at all mm. because we've got so we've already got space. You know, we got and what happens with a lot of elderly people is they stay in the family home. They want to age in place, and that's often the best for them mentally and yep. physically. And yet they've probably got two, three spare rooms in the house. They mm. probably don't drive the car anymore, so mm. the garage isn't being used either. So you've got a lot of under-occupied properties. Yep. Now, you've also got a lot of people that need affordable housing. Now, a lot of elderly people... They can't maintain the garden anymore. They might need help to do with their shopping or taking to doctors or hospital appointments, that sort of thing, or even just some social interaction, someone to sit down and have a cup of tea with them. Now, could we develop a model that enables the younger person or the other person to have an affordable rent, an agreement between the elder person well, I would like 10 hours of your time, so at um, $30 or $40 an hour, that yep. works out as so many hours a week, we'll discount your rent to something that is affordable. Mm. And But also is maybe looking at um, whether at the same time we can do some adaptation of the property to make it more resilient to climate change and the increase yep. in heat that we're going to have. And that potentially could help with, I mean, energy poverty. Again, a lot of older people don't have a high disposable income. Yep. And if your home doesn't have any insulation in it, you've got an old-fashioned heating, cooling mm. system that burns energy. Energy prices, I think, have gone up something like a 60% in the last eight years or something like yep. that. They would really struggle on a fixed income. Mm -hmm. So we got something that potentially can alleviate energy poverty, perhaps uh, mitigate some social isolation, mm. which is, again, meant to be one of our issues we're going to be facing, uh, provide affordable accommodation to others mm. that need it, uh, and enable us to do some housing adaptation to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. It's killing so many birds <laughs> with one stone. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, these are the things that will work. come out. Yeah. So, I mean, Airbnb yeah. didn't Humans will get exist. in the way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it didn't exist. Now it's so common. Yeah. You know, things like this will will yeah. come out. You know, people will start converting their, their garages exactly, because I don't studio. need a car to a studio yeah. apartment. To, and so I think, you know, the future of housing, you know, will have to take on things like yeah. this because, you know, there is only, yeah. if you want to keep growing a population, unless you keep building, you Exactly. And I build? also think integration is vital because if young people never see old people, if yeah. rich people never see poor people, you end up isolated with a monoculture mm. and you don't have empathy and understanding of how people can struggle. I was in the supermarket the other day and a young person in front of me had got four or five items, everything was discounted and it came to $9.81 and he couldn't pay for it. He put his card on and it got declined and he tried it again and it got declined and he was absolutely devastated and he was going to put it all back and so I, I paid for it. Mm. Um, but And I, you know, probably the same age as my kids and I just thought that is devastating. Mm. Yeah. You, the, you've got quite a lot of food there for under $10 and you can't pay for it, you know, and this is a affluent Society. Society. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, secure parking, I, I love what they're doing there, basically, yeah. um, you know, because their park, car parks are busy during the day, but yeah. between like 6 a.m. and 7 p.m., the car parks are empty. So 
then I, I opening the doors to the homeless and setting yeah. up beds and saying, well, wow. you know, if you want yeah. somewhere that's warm and that's in, well, sheltered, chill- use that warm. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah sheltered. I mean, well, it's warmer than, uh, you know, a Sydney kind of storm yeah. coming through. Yeah, but, a windy, rainy night for yeah. sure. But, I wow. mean, like just things like this is, is you know, there is, you know, people yeah. that come, you know, yeah. there's opportunities that, you know, people, if yeah. they put their heads heads on and think, well, actually, I'm not going to make money out of this, yeah. but it is actually going to help people. It's yeah. creating a better society. And, yeah. Yeah. and then at the day, yeah. secure also then yeah. become a more of a, you know, a better brand out well, there yeah, that people well, want yeah. to support. And, you know, Absolutely. there'll be there'll be money come there. So I guess yeah. it's when they put the focus the right way, yeah. things come down yeah. the line. I mean, I, as I say, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to have all of your possessions in a bag and never know where you're going to sleep from one horrible. night to the next. Mm. And well, it's called a nomad nowadays. Yeah. A digital nomad do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, it's a choice though. <laughs> so, I mean, we also uh, interviewed Michelle Adair, who's the CEO of the. Oh, I wish I could remember the organisation, the Housing Trust. I think it is, and that's episode for those who uh, want to go back to it. Ooh, I think that's episode sixty six. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, yeah, she talked about how easy it is. It's so much easier to become homeless. You know, the, for some people yeah. they're really in a fragile state and, yeah. and a, a couple of misfortunes um, and then they could find themselves in That's that situation. Right. It's very easy to unravel. I think what you said is interesting about, you know, we need to keep that diversity in society so we don't forget. It's a bit like we don't want to have a physical manifestation of the echo chamber of social media where we only get to see our own That's feed. That's right. yeah. Um, and it is important. Yes. Mm. And that, I think... Uh, that social media and, and all of the internet stuff, your searches and now everything is recorded. I mean, to me, that is really beginning to concern me because I think, like you say, it is an echo chamber. Mm. We don't realise it. And yeah. in many ways we're sort of sleepwalking to yeah. who knows what, mm. really. The whole premise of this podcast is, is you know, the elephant in the room, the elephant being the uh, metaphor for the subconscious mind and yeah. all those behavioural biases that we all, they Have. you know, we all operate yeah. with them. And our very first yeah. first episode, if you want to go back, listeners, <laughs> is to, uh, you know, with Simon Russell, who's a behavioural uh, scientist, and he went to an auction and, and saw those things in play. But the confirmation bias is a massive one. And yes. so it, and we're all, we all suffer it. Yeah. Absolutely we all suffer it. In fact, I've met this woman yesterday who's a massive fan of the Jacksons, you know, and, and um, massive. like what, and the, I, the band? The band. And yeah. I said to her, so how do you reconcile yourself with, you know, with sort of what Michael was getting up to? Yeah. I don't believe it's true. Uh, and I went, yes, oh, yeah. okay, of course. Um Tell me why you don't believe it's true. Well, I just don't read any of that stuff. I do not believe it. I cannot imagine it. I just will not. I just oh, will not gosh. accept it. Yeah. And and you just think, well, there you go. There's there's an absolute clear yeah. manifestation of what confirmation bias yeah. does. It, I have willingly chosen not to look at, listen to, watch, yeah. um, read, talk to anybody who or anything who is going to tell me anything other than what I want to believe. And mm. and that is what yeah. a lot of us do, whether we're aware of it or not. Like you say, we're sleepwalking. Yeah. Every week we hear incredible stories of the dumb things property buyers do. Dumb things that end up costing a whole lot of money and or creating a whole lot of stress. Mistakes that can be avoided. Please, Sarah, can you give us an example of a property dumbo? We can all learn what not to do from these stories. I, I, well, I guess the property dumbo would be that, uh, um, you know, the standards in our building codes are really not going to deliver the the extent of, mitigation adaptation that we need in the next 11 years so we really need to up our game and we need to call that out really and who would who would we follow you know like who, what's the so i think it's, it's you know if no one in the world's doing it it's you know you yeah. always need a leader yeah oh i mean if you look at uh, i mean again sort of the energy efficiency was introduced in a lot of european countries in the 80s and it was a the oil crisis uh, you know Pre, pre preempted that, and I was really surprised that we didn't start to mandate energy efficiency in Australia until two thousand and five, two thousand and six for residential and commercial buildings. So we're really behind the eight ball. We've been very fortunate that we've had cheap energy. We've had a very nice climate, so yeah. we we haven't really needed to do it, but. For the climate, we have to, we have to. And the 
era of cheap energy is is over and uh, we really need to sort of get out of fossil fuels, although that is going to be politically, uh, economically very challenging. Well, that is an interesting dumbo because at the end of the day we're buying property then that's been, I guess, built following some pretty dumb controls. <laughs> we're not really thinking of the future when we're building nor when we're buying. And things that probably won't be valuable in the future, right? We're buying things that, you know, won't compete with the better stock that comes out. You know, when the buildings come out in the future, they're going to be better than what have currently been built. And if you own something like that, that means that that not only is there more supply, but it's actually better than yours. And that's a big worry for people who own these buildings because it just can't compete in the new world. It's like having like an electric car or a petrol car when electric cars are out. Yeah, the dinosaur. Well, it's like a beta be- a video. If we've got like a- selling it. Yeah, a friend made a good point around electric cars the other day. He was like, oh, well, you know, why doesn't it? We're just chatting around it. I was like, well, yeah. you know, Labor's policy around changing. and Yeah, but they like- only take eight minutes to recharge, remember? Or was it six minutes? Well, I mean, <laughs> well, reality, it's going to get quicker because it's what uh, we talked about. Yeah, I know. So, it was a bit and- of a joke about the fact that. You know, yeah. sorry, Labor have come out with so many policies and a lot of them are extraordinarily admirable, but, yeah. you know, the detail is a little, a little lacking. Yeah, I but mean, with Labor, on. I'm on this. I'm like, you know, as part of their, you know, overall policy. I don't so. disagree with the idea of it. I just, yeah. I just, it does scare me that there's all these great ideas. It's like a think tank. It's actually mm. not like, you know, um, well thought out policy. But anyway, keep policy, going. At, at least it's uh, in the right direction on mm, climate change. Yeah. I mean, it's um, you know, liberal don't even want to talk about it. So, oh I god, I'm not, I'm not advocating for liberal here yeah. at all. <laughs> yeah, and I think the, yeah. um, but I mean, it's it's real conundrum for the government because you know, if we start going down this direction, it's just one other tax that they're not going to get. You know, it's like the amount of tax they yeah. get on fuel is is ridiculous. And I guess it's the the problem with yes. Australia is we we. We just, unless we're forced to do it, we, we don't we don't make a change. And like all the other countries around the world are leading in these things and mm. we're just like, oh, we don't have to do it, do uh, we? We can still get another three years of government. And I think it's um, yeah. it's getting a bit ridiculous really on, on, on a lot of action around this stuff because there's no one in power that really cares about it. You no. Know? And, uh, you know, those that do, that trying to actually get something done is just so, so hard. Too many I, competing yeah. forces. We need an autocrat. Yeah. Many, many years ago I came across this uh, thing by written by a guy called Charles Handy and it was a management book and it was, again, about sort of behaviour and he had this analogy. He said, if you put a frog into a pot of boiling water, yes. jumps out immediately and it lives. Mm. Yeah. If you put... A frog into a pot, cold water, put it on the stove and heat it up, it will die. It will boil to death. Happily. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whinging probably. Uh, yeah, Actually, not happily, but I, I it won't to, jump out of the yeah, pot. And yeah. I think, you know, we're the frogs in the pot mm. and, uh, um, you know, we really need to jump out and uh, do something yeah. else. And uh, But getting us to do that is, is going to be the challenge. And Well, the problem is humans won't die at first, unfortunately. So, you know, we, we will... You know, the humans will just keep growing as a population. Yeah. We're slowly dying. You know, we're not growing as fast as we are. But it'll be all the other things that die first. And, yeah. you know, humans but are the top of the tree. So once the sea level rises, yeah. uh, you will get population migration on a level that we have never, ever experienced before. Mm. And if you look at north of our border is Indonesia. And there's 250, 300 million Indonesians living on very low-lying land. And they will need to go somewhere else. And if you look at what's happened in Europe with the Syrian refugees and migration and the political drama that has ensued and arguments within countries about who accepts people and how Mm, many you accept and where they go and how those people have been treated, Mm. once we get climate change migration that, you know... That's yep. going to be really, really scary. Well, we, we can't. Af- we can't. Uh, we're, we're full, aren't we, in Australia? <laughs> We've uh, put a cap on our uh, refugees. We can't have any more of them arrive. Three thousand or something. Yeah, yeah. that's. Uh, yeah, but yes. um, no, you're right though yeah. because it's it's you know if if they've got to leave, they they can't let them. We can't just let them drown, right? And no. they've got to leave. So, you know, who's going to take yeah. them? And then you know, wars start, and you know, exactly. and things like that start. So, 
you know, it's, it's, it's a huge issue that well, I not many people think about. We've got two topics for further interviews. So we'd love to get you back at another stage, Sarah, because there's two topics here that we want to talk more about. And that is, you know, where the controls or building controls are letting us down, really, mm. uh, where there's all those missed opportunities, but also on population growth. And, you know, if we're going to have climate change, or we do have climate change, but if the sea levels rise and, and we're going to have massive migration, uh, yeah, we're going to have another demand yeah. on our housing stock, aren't we? <laughs> we are. We need to build quickly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you for asking Thank me. you. We want to make you a better elephant rider. And this week's elephant rider training is... One of the things that Sarah talked about was the fact that we instinctively like and appreciate being in a nice environment, but we don't often deconstruct what those elements are. And I think that deconstructing them is really important for property buyers because that's when you can start to really identify the sorts of characteristics a property will have that will add value. I mean, Sarah did mention about the fact that that studies have shown that properties with all of these environmentally sustainable features that add to comfort does translate into increased value. So that's obviously something very important for property buyers to understand. So deconstructing those elements is important. So, you know, and a lot of them, they seem like no-brainers and and that um, shading on the external windows. And once again, go back to episode 62 with Cecile Weldon for lots of tips on this. But, you know, adequate insulation, um, ceiling fans in bedrooms, the proper awnings, you know, to ensure that the sun doesn't directly hit the glass in summer, thermal mass, the foliage outside and actually having some soft surfaces and trees and greenery to look at, but also to increase comfort in the area. You know, we look at it in our business, we actually we score every property that we evaluate on what we call a capital growth predictive indicator score. And and a lot of these features are, you know, there's about 30 features that we would score every individual property on. And a lot of these features are very prominent in this list. And they are all the things that add to comfort. So I would say, you know, the northern orientation, all of those sorts of things. So start actually thinking more constructively when you walk through a home as to what is it that I like about this property. So if you just feel that you like it, let's start looking around and being much more critical and much more, uh, I guess, forensic in your evaluation of every individual property that you look at. Join us for our next episode when we get one of our favourites back for a second interview. Kent Lardner, a data specialist. He absolutely understands property data. What I love about Kent is that he also understands the problems with data. And we have a very, very robust chat about all things to do with AVMs and median prices and suburb charts and top 50s and top 5s and top 10s and all of that sort of stuff. All the things that we're tempted to look into when we're buying property, we're tempted to be swayed by some of this information and how we need to be able to look a little bit deeper to understand what's going on so that we know what information we can rely on when we're making our decisions. Another cracker episode. Please join us. Don't forget we're on all the social channels. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. Or you can connect with us on theelephantintheroom.com.au. The links are all there for you. Please connect and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. The Elephant in the Room property podcast is recorded at the Sydney Sound Brewery. This week's podcast was recorded by John Resk. Editorial by Gordy Fletcher. Until next week, don't be a dumbo. Now remember, everything we talked about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent who will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances with a statement of advice.